Thank you very much. Um, first off, I'd like to express my gratitude to all the organizers of this conference and uh, the board for selecting my paper and uh, providing me with the opportunity to present it to you today. In my PhD project, I'm studying the late Anglo-Saxon elite, uh, the, the lay elite that is, the so-called thanes. Today's presentation is one of the aspects of this topic that I found under-researched, namely the possible Scandinavian contribution to the formation of the Thainly class in England. And if that works, um, here's a writ from the 11th century, the um, Anglo-Saxon writ, and here's one of the runestones mentioning the Thanes, the Thicken. Right. I'll start with a brief overview of the historiographical situation. Even though the Thanes have been studied before, the current discussion, it seems, lacks a comprehensive synthesis, and I would actually describe it as a vicious circle, as you can read on my slide. Um, the Anglo-Saxon sources are the richest in the present context, but their relevant majority comes from the 11th century, and the majority of this majority comes from one person, Archbishop Wilson of York, who either wrote them or one or the other way edited them. Um, the other problem with the Anglo-Saxon approach has been the inexplicable disregard for the cognate words in other Germanic languages. In turn, students of the Viking Age, for one, have for a long time been caught up in the comparison of the Thanes and Drains, which, as pointed out by Judith Chesh, who unfortunately couldn't be here today, um, proved to be a stalemate. Additionally, it was common to relate to the Anglo-Saxon material without any due source analysis. And finally, linguists and philologists, unfortunately, have so far usually overlooked the concrete historical context when working on this topic. They would usually take the, all, of, all the available sources and mix them and blend in one uh, synthetic portrait, so to speak. So what I propose is a discriminant analysis of the extant sources, starting with establishing the etymology uh, we should then look at the earliest Anglo-Saxon Scandinavian sources um, in search of the so-called, uh, so to speak, original meaning of the word thing in the both societies. Uh, then we can add the less clear-cut sources. In case of uh, the Anglo-Saxon material, that would be Bishop Wollstone and some others. In case of uh, the Scandinavian sources, that would be the sagas, the laws, and others from the 13th century onwards. And only after this has been done, I would justify to probably look at possible parallels or influences. It is also worth noting that chronology of the sources is of equal importance. You see, when we say 11th century, that, act, that usually encompasses uh, 100 years. That is three to four, maybe even five generations. And so the society is not usually that stable, you would say. Right. A firm etymology of the word thing was established more than 100 years ago. It is most likely derived from the Indo-European root tech and related to the Greek words child and begat. The semantic evolution would be from boy to servant via the intermediate meaning young man, and this is not something we do not come across in other um, Indo-European languages. I've written out the uh, example of Latin poor, late Old English knicht and Old Russian otrok. They basically mean the same thing, a boy. And later on it, it came to mean a servant and sometimes a vassal of a king. And as I was told by our French-speaking colleagues even today in France, a person who serves you um, in a restaurant that is a waiter can be called garçon, which is basically a boy. So this is not something unfamiliar. Um, from here, we find general logical derivatives in Old English and Old High German, such as to serve, uh, female servant, disciple, and some others. Old English also produced its own unique thing compounds, such as chreil uh, that is a keeper of vestment, uh, berthain, that is a chamberlain, and some others. Let's go to the English material. In England, first of all, in Wessex. The main occurrence of the word thane before the 10th century can be found in the formula King's Thane, and this topic has been previously thoroughly researched by Lawrence Larson and Henry Loyne. As much as our sources can tell us, from the end of the 8th century, kings began to reward the thane retainers with a special form of land tenure, 
previously reserved specifically for the church, the tenure is known as Buckland. As such, Buckland was fully alignable, but demanded its owners, regardless of who they were, to perform the three services known as common uh, burdens, that is, military service, building and maintaining fortresses and bridges. This topic has been extensively explored by Richard Abels in his classical book uh, from 1988, Lordship and Military Obligation in Anglo-Saxon England. Such practice led to both social and linguistic mutations. In a nutshell, you would have a king's servant who would la later on be re read as a retainer plus land equals a landed king's vassal. By the end of the 10th century, um, the word thing, it seems, evolved to denote a landed vassal, an aristocrat. But this was, presumably, only the tip of the iceberg. Some, since Buckland could be acquired not from the king directly, as long as the owner bore the common burdens, it appears in the closing years of the Anglo-Saxon period there existed a class of people who enjoyed the rights and privileges of thanes, but had lords other than the king, bishops, earls, abbots, and even king's thanes too. However, though the true strata, that is the king's thanes and the non-royal thanes, probably constituted one social class, they were not necessarily genetically connected. And uh, to recap this um, evolution, here's an animation to visualize uh, this process that corresponds with the change in the name of the present conference. You can see that a person from uh, King's Retinue a thane who stands behind the king, not next to the king, receives some land and would later become a landed aristocrat. This is a uh, very common reconstruction. Mm, unfortunately, it's based on Archbishop Coulson's uh, re record, but in the absence of anything better, this is the best I can provide. Right. In Scandinavia, that evolution of the term and possibly the social reality behind it is not as clear cut. As Professor Judas Josh put it, in the scholar corpus, the word thane is often untranslatable and hovering between being general terms of approbation and technical terms of rank. In most cases, the word's meaning could be rendered as man in different contexts. I'm not aware of any works that would concentrate on tracing the evolution of the usage of the word thane in the scholar verse or overall in Scandinavian sources. I would suggest that the general sense man was probably derived from the older usage that is retainer or a man of somebody. Thenceforth, it would be used in plural. It could, be de it could denote people in general. And then it would just take a little step forward towards subjects. Nonetheless, a disclaimer must be made. Uh, this is only my hypothetical reconstruction. I do not hold that this is the absolute truth. In the runic inscriptions, the usage of the term in consideration is somewhat more confined. At the moment, we have discovered at least 46 rune stones from the period between roughly 970 and 1050 that would comm commemorate certain things. Two earlier exceptions are to be found in Denmark. They are the Gunnarop stone and the Glavenrum stone from the first half of the 10th century. Nevertheless, these two do not fall, fall out of the general line. Despite the long run out debate, modern scholarship agrees that the things from the runic inscriptions were well to do local magnates, presumably the top stratum of the free land owners. And here you have some uh, differences. People coming from the approach of the runic studies would rather see them as uh, local magnates, and people coming from the scholastic perspective would rather see them as the top, top stratum of the free uh, class of landowners. Some historians, for instance Peter Sawyer and Karl Lofing, argue that the Old Norse usage of the word thane we find on the runestones was influenced by the English one. This could well explain the transition from a man of another person, retainer, to local magnate in the Scandinavian context where we find no traces of any grants of land, and I personally would be the first one to support it. However, unfortunately, the ground for such justification is shaky. Uh, to simplify the thing, uh, there are certain missing links and white spots in this hypothesis. But could the opposite be true? In other words, could Anglo-Saxon social landscape have experienced any influence from that of Scandinavian? In fact, we've got a few sources which mention the things in a 
somewhat funny way if you look at it from the West Saxon perspective. And this is where the diversity joins the game. In a Northumbrian law code uh, from probably around mid 10th century, we find things with a high Virgild. Surprisingly, there's virtually no connection to the king or Buckland in that passage, neither in the wording nor in the context. Uh, in a very peculiar rule from the last quarter of the 10th century, we find an otherwise non-recorded guild of things in Cambridgeshire. Of particular interest here are three points. First, there's again no implication of any affiliation with the king. Second, though the West Saxon law prohibited vendettas, the keynote of the whole rule is the blood food. And third, the rule extends the guild brothers from carrying out vendetta in the presence of the king, bishop, and elderman. And that is to say that it is completely something that falls out with the West Saxon things. The West Saxon things we know acted as uh, royal officers. You, it would be really strange to expect a royal officer to neglect the law of his king, you would say. A slightly younger law code of uh, King Ethelred, issued specifically for the Dane law, prescribes for the twelve eldest thanes to act as jury of presentment in their local weapon takes. On two occasions in the 11th century, the thanes, led by their eldermen or earls, were involved in the royal succession question. And in 1066, in Yorkshire, thanes went as far as to rebel against Earl Toasty and force him to flee. Finally, in some 11th century sources, the Danish things are separated from their Anglo-Saxon counterparts, although it can be argued that this was rather in terms of ethnicity and not necessarily social standing. As of now, I believe there are three major fields where the presence of Scandinavian things in late Anglo-Saxon England might be deduced. Although, I must say, uh, much of the evidence uh, is of one or the other way elusive. Nevertheless, let's look at them. First of all, the social aspect. The things from Cambridgeshire united in some guild actually remind me of the Scandinavian Feloch, um, specifically because both take care of burying or and commemorating their comrades. Uh, now there's a counter-argument. Uh, we have at least 20 inscriptions with uh, or one or two Felagi uh, commemorating their fallen or deceased comrade, but they were refer they are referred to as Drenger, not as Thanes. Uh, nevertheless, I think uh, a parallel might be seen here. Um, in and the Northumbrian Thanes, who enjoy their extended Virgild and independently of any royal service, could in a way reflect the Thanes from the Scandinavian runic inscriptions, uh, as I've seen, they are wealthy. Uh, local magnates who are presumably not very connected to the king. The Virgil, the Virgil in North Lederlage does not seem to correspond with any royal service or any affiliation with the king whatsoever. Uh, next, the political aspect. According to the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, in the 11th century, the Thanes had a solid say in politics. Twice, their consent was vital for the succession question, and on the eve of the Norman conquest, they even expelled an earl from the Northern Danelaw. Now we must, of course, uh, see earls as being, well, agents of politics and not just objects. And they were definitely to some sort independent, but still, they ca their power came from the king. They were legitimized by their as association with the king. The Thanes deliberately rebelled against such a person. And at the same time, seven contemporary scaldic stances speak of Norwegian kings crushing the Thanes' resistance. This led Professor Jesh to suggest that the Scandinavian things were an important player in the political process of the time and they were resenting the growing power of the kings. Next, there's a further linguistic aspect. At least three times, the Anglo-Saxon things are called good. Uh, on one occasion, in fact, these are the good things in Cambridgeshire, uh, um, if I may. Um, it's an account of the battles with the Danes, where, um, um, where there was a battle and uh, some uh, shires, that is the thirds of the shires, fled, but the, uh, the third of Cambridgeshire stood uh, proudly and there, f there fell um, many, many men and many other good things, that is, of Cambridgeshire. And uh, I do not think that I need to remind you that Cambridgeshire is definitely the Dane law. 
Um, yes. And this might be tied in with the language of the runic inscriptions where the things are described as good in 100% cases. They are good, all good, best, and so forth. In one of his famous writs, King Canut addresses his recipients as all my things with both 200 shilling and 1200 shilling virgils. This is highly unusual because in other dichotomic formula of this, of this sort, the word thing would only be applied to the upper 1200 shilling class. Now, there was a certain treaty between the Welsh and the English, which is roughly dated from the end of the 10th century, or maybe the last quarter of the 10th century, where the, the things are described, oh, not the, I'm sorry, not the things, the English or the Anglo-Saxons are described to be a Carol born and thane born, that is, a burn, a born uh, churls and born uh, things. Here we see a different picture. The, the both, both, cl I'm sorry, both classes, both classes, I'm sorry, uh, are... Um, Elemin of Thanes, 1200 and 200, both are described as uh, being Thanes. When compared to Knut's first letter of uh, 1020, the Thanes from the writ seem to mean the same thing as third scooper collectively subjects. It has been argued that in the Skaldic verse, the word Thane can also be uh, sometimes applied to mean simply subjects, people, that is, subjects of a king. Uh, for instance, we've got, uh, in all cases where the, the kings uh, are, uh, well, are subject, subjugate their things, it might be read as um, subjects. And um, Sequat, uh, in one of his stanzas, says that now the things are um, happy at contempt with the, with the peace. And this can also mean people as people of the country, subjects. And uh, there's also a formula Lund of Thena, which can uh, be found in one of the Skaldic stances and in later in Sagas. And Sagas' wording also offers such reading. For instance, uh, uh, the Saga of St. Olaf and Saga of Gisli, where the, um, where the, the people accept uh, the king, uh, they bow to him and become his things. And I would read it as subjects, and very much close to what we have with King Canute, and I don't think I need to emphasize that King Canute was a Dane himself. Well, half Polish perhaps, but this doesn't matter in the, in the present context. Um, yes. Uh, and finally, the things. Uh, how much time do I have? I was just going to say five minutes. Oh, so, so much. Mm, that's great. That's great. I can, I, I can go and on and go and on and on. Well, I love this topic. And finally, <laughs> And finally, uh, the thing's age. Now, this is something somewhat shaky, but uh, I came across this thought when I was um, thinking over this topic actually in this lecture hall. Uh, so it is quite raw at the moment, but uh, I, I'm eager to listen what you have to say to this. Um, apart from the poetic sources, uh, as far as I know, there are three poetic sources uh, when we have the eldest things uh, in other sources. Uh, three times do we come across the so-called eldest things in Anglo-Saxon England. What is actually meant here is uncertain. Uh, for instance, as just mentioned, uh, the uh, uh, Seifert, or, or Seifert, how do you read him? And Morkere were the eldest things of the seven burgs, that is not, of course, the five burgs, we know that, the five boroughs, uh, who were killed by Edric Strona. And um, I think this, of course, can be just a coincidence. After all, we know that um, we don't have we don't have the full uh, our um, our corpus of the Anglo-Saxon documents is not as full as we, we wished. Um, it's I think it is also telling that the first occasions with the eldest things are from the Danelaw here, and uh, well, the five boroughs are of course in the Danelaw, and <coughs> later on we have them in um, Worcestershire, which is the West Saxon part of uh, England. Um, now, um, it might be a mere coincidence, but curiously, the things in the runic inscriptions, as well as the skaldic verse, are almost exclusively, thank you, are almost exclusively portrayed as mature men. In the runic inscriptions, they're usually husbands and uh, fathers. A conclusion in a nutshell. As suggested by the linguistic evidence, the word thane 
in the sense servant, was apparently indigenous to both Old English and Old Norse. And Jan Paul Strid, I'm not sure my Swedish is not that good, um, actually established that the form we have the word thing recorded in on the runic, uh, on the runestone in Sweden at least, seems to be native. It wasn't an import word. Uh, due to the parted parts of the social development with time, the two languages handle, handle it differently, though not entirely radically. In Old English, especially in Wessex, it came to mean a king, king's vassal and generally landed nobleman who still bears the common burdens imposed by the king. In Old Norse, where no land tenure was involved at the time, the word became synonymous with the general meaning man and henceforth probably subjects. At some point in the end of the 10th century, it acquired an additional association with the wealthy local landowners who had a say in the, king, in the kingdom's affairs. A careful reading of the Anglo-Saxon sources allows us to think that the word thing was sometimes applied in the Old Norse sense, which in turn could allow us to see it as a reflection of the social influence from Scandinavia. Uh, conceivably, this usage first appeared in the Danelo as a contact zone, but at the moment this remains a hypothesis. And to recap this uh, hypothesis is another visualization. Yeah. <laughs> um, there still persists a question whether we're dealing with a linguistic or rather social phenomenon, and I hope to address it in my future research. And in conclusion, I would like to thank you all for your attention and to thank the uh, Professor uh, Mikael Eke Nielsen and Gillian uh, Fellows Jelensen from uh, the Copenhagen University and Professor Lena Melnikova, my official tutor in Moscow, who have been helping me with this project so far. Thank you. Thank you very much. I see your hands popping up. Yeah, I would expect that. <laughs> so much. I really love your stuff as well. <laughs> uh, uh, I was just thinking when you when you mentioned the um, uh, the thing skilled in Cambridge, where I seem to have some responsibility with our fellows in the gospel, burial, and taking revenge. Uh, I, if I remember correctly, I think those are the same features that you find in the oldest guild legislation of Norway. So have you looked into those? Not yet, but I, I'm really grateful for this indication. What is, what is the date of those well, revolutions? That is actually kind of uh, debatable. <laughs> well, uh, well, I mean, roughly. Some people would think that they go back to pre Christian times, whereas others would see them as developing during 11th, perhaps 12th century. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, I, I got quite a few references and that stuff, but it, but it just struck me that um, and they are for guild legislation in, in all ways as well. Well, thank you very much. There definitely seem to be some similarities there. Yeah, I would think so, if you could send me the references, because um, I have spoken to some archaeologists and they uh, proved that Cambridge at the time of when the uh, when this regulation was drawn up uh, was actually on the rise in economical terms, and that would that would probably explain why there was this unusual Scandinavian feature. It's not the only guild we have, uh, but it's the only things <coughs> guild we have. And um, it, has been, it has been argued that probably uh, those guilds established in the first place, were established in the first place as a so, uh, sort of um, uh, um, compensation uh, with, the, uh, with the decaying um, tribal organization when the when the king was in the kindred was, could not provide for their members and so instead you would you would bond with with the your peers but this is a speculation we can't really tell thank you yeah, but, I, but i think that is quite the same story. yes it's yes going on in regards to the dating of the of the earliest uh, uh, norwegian guilds as well i mean those who want to push it uh push it back in, in time uh and, I, and another thing that also struck me is that uh, when you, you have some reference to the things in the diplomas where you are singled out as, well, you know, good. Uh, are those the only, are, are they singled out as being sort of considered better witnesses because they're good in some sense than the other witnesses? Because in, in diplomas in Norway, you can see that there are some people, and that could actually be women as well, but that there are occasionally they are addressed as, as good, actually using that word. In, in, in the witness list? Yes. 
Well, uh, I do not really recall any mentions of good things in witness lists. Uh, women occasionally uh, um, attest the chapters as well. And I'm very sorry that I left the gender question out of the conversation because unfortunately my sources do not provide me with any gender material. But um, no, I, do, I, do, I don't really think it's somehow reflected in the charters. Um, um, those those I, I refer to were actually not royal diplomas. They were uh, the miscellaneous charters like the, uh, mar uh, the marriage agreements, for example. Are you familiar with Sarah Yes, yes, yes. Okay, right. Um, I've had about 300 annotations to this book uh, when I was reading it, so I'm quite familiar with it. And this is why I was trying to leave Wilson out of this conversation, because mm -hmm. his legacy is voluminous, but at the same time it's very, very uneasy, it's very difficult to actually gorge it. They, they have a new project, the Gerson project. It might be quite interesting you know, to, to, to get in touch with them. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the information. Gareth? Thanks for a, a very interesting paper. Um, I wonder whether there is an issue in tracing the evolution the way that you do on the Anglo-Saxon side with the nature of the surviving evidence. That a lot of the early references that we have refer specifically to King's things, and whether the fact that they are distinguished as such means that there is a wider meaning of thing from which they are being distinguished, which would then perhaps mean that some of your, what you're portraying as a later meaning is actually there more widely earlier on. And given that bookland creates potentially very large estates, which one could expect to be subdivided from the 8th and certainly 9th century onwards, whether that general meaning of fame representing a land landholding class but not necessarily with specific ties to the kingship, could actually be there much, uh, much earlier. And the, the other thought um, is, have you looked not just at the old English references to things, but the equivalent Latin terms, mm -hmm. um, which again mm -hmm. could provide the answers? Mm -hmm, thank you. The, that is a very relevant question. Uh, I'll start from the from the end because it's easier. In uh, Latin. In, the, in, in Latin, in the royal diplomas, the word thing in 95% cases is uh, translated as minister, which is definitely a servant, and in, on, on some occasions it's milis, uh, vavasa, and some others, very rare occasions. Uh, in later sources, and I, I didn't make a reference to it, but I think it's worth looking into it, that in the Doomsday Book, for example, they're not referred to as min uh, ministers, they're tiny regis. Uh, probably the um, the commissioners of the Doomsday Book were not familiar with this usage. Probably they just heard the word and it didn't mean anything to him, to them. Um, as for the earlier usage, well, um, this is also a very valid um, note here uh, that uh, the earlier meanings actually come from are rec reconstructed from the time around King Alfred, because we have the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle and we have the translations from Latin, and they were all put together in uh, the late 9th century. So when we say that in the 7th century it meant that and that, um, not specifically. Uh, it is what the people in the, end, in the late 9th century wrote about it. We have Bede, but Bede wrote in Latin, and it might be dangerous to simply translate with the later meanings. But um, in the vernacular sources uh, that were written originally in Old English, the only occurrence is the king's thing. In the translated sources, such as Vitas and others, we find occasionally we find servants to abbots and bishops and other people in general meaning as uh, simply a servant, not a slave or, or, a, or a serf or anything. And it's also mentioned as a, as a thing. But I would actually think that this development took on in the 10th century because we have a, an explosion in the charter productions. Uh, um, I always thought that the, the situation with different types of tenure was never going to be as simple as these people hold in this one way and these other people hold in a different way and that maybe King's things were, were a, a reference to um, a particular kind of tenure that uh, gets, gets, in a sense, simplified later when the categories are created. Anyway, can I ask you about um, themes in place names? Because uh, you didn't mm -hmm, mention that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, I left it out for the sake of time, but yeah. it was actually Carl Luffing's uh, 
point in one in his third chapter in the monograph from 2001, um, he actually went into discussion the so-called Feinbur uh, beer. I'm not sure my Swedish is actually bad. Um, in um, on the um, eastern uh, shore of Kattegat and uh, Skagerrak, and he has it that this was probably there are 18 of them. Mm -hmm. um, in and Denmark? In Sweden, in Sweden, um, and they are all they are all uh, arranged in a along a trade route which can be reconstructed from west to east, which is which relates to the present topic. And Karl Löfing would have it. I do not have an opinion on that. I just I'll just recite him. Uh, he has it that um, those were the uh, settlements or probably uh, some forts uh, built presumably under King Swain or maybe uh, that is, is Swain the Folkway or probably Harald Bluetooth um, to establish the presence of the king to control these trade routes. But um, the only evidence we have is from the archaeological evidence. So we, the dating is only from the archaeological finds. and. Uh, as for um, English material, I haven't looked at it. It would be speaking. interesting. I don't yes. know how many, you know, Tainbu and so on are recorded before um, they yes. turn up in Doomsday Book, but it would be very interesting to correlate not just the name, but with the type of site. Because <coughs> yes. looking at it in the landscape, you might find there's something consistent with the, the placing of these things. Still have two months in Copenhagen? Yes. Yeah. Fantastic. Any, uh, I think actually, uh, I've violated the. Um, convention and ask the last question myself. So mm. I, can try. Um, I can see that we are due coffee. So if we could just thank Dennis. Thank you very much.